Hi everyone, I'm Tech Bob. Welcome to eTech Facebook Live Fridays. Today is about the Blue Laser. We're literally doing everything involving the Blue Laser from unboxing it. Oop, let me mute this. From unboxing it to what I have right here, how to do that, some tips as far as the packaging and unboxing it goes, uh, how to set it up so what to uh, take off like screws and brackets wise, what, how to do the calibration process, which is a common question we get. And then I'm actually gonna run a phone through here too. And I'll also speak through some, some common support questions we get. I won't mention those just yet, but we'll get to them probably here in the next couple minutes. This will be a longer stream since we're doing the whole thing. This is a great video though. If you just bought a Blue Laser and have questions, we're gonna answer pretty much everything you could have. Or you're thinking about buying a Blue Laser, this is also gonna cover everything. So let's start off with the unpackaging. You don't need all of these tools, but having them definitely helps. I would say a flathead is, is the one that you might, you know, that not you might need. You need something about this big. You can have a pry bar or something metal about this too to get these tabs up because there's metal tabs you have to bend. Um, this is where, this is again, not, uh, you don't have to have this, but using these helps with the process. So these pliers help kind of straighten out the tabs if they don't bend correctly. And the hammer, we use it more for sealing the boxes after we've tested and calibrated the machines. But um, for opening, it does help if you use the hook part, or what is this called, the, the tail end of the hammer, to get the lid and lift it up. But, so first we're gonna do is bend up all the tabs, which there's a total of eight, so it's two on each side. And these vary, sometimes they are bent downward, sometimes they're bent upwards. We try not to bend it too crazy to where uh, it's easy for you to open, but we also want to make sure that in transit nothing happens so the lid doesn't come off or nothing comes loose. All right, so we've got all the tabs up. Now what we do is if you just take the back end of the hammer and just hook it underneath and lift up, it should break the lid up. Now, tip here, so I, I literally just lifted the lid off. You take a Sharpie and you draw a line between the lid and the crate it helps remind you where the, the lid was on. So typically, say if I rotate it like this, it should fit, but these clips are perfectly aligned to these ends right here. So if you keep it the same way, uh, you're gonna have a bit easier time if you have to rebox it. Speaking of the box, highly recommend keeping the box. If your laser has some type of issue um, and it for some reason has to come into us for service, you really cannot ship this laser in just a cardboard box. Um, it's too heavy, and what happens when the shipper handles it and it's not in the wooden crate, the weight of the machine actually breaks through the box and causes more damage. So it does have to come back in the original box that it was shipped in. So you have a styrofoam cube that covers the top of the laser machine. We have the fume extractor tube, so we're gonna move that to the side. Oh, and again, I'm just unboxing right now. I'm gonna go over each individual component when we need it. We don't need the tubes yet, so we'll get to that in a second. Um, we have a packet that comes with each laser we sell. So this has very quick just setup instructions. The important part on here, I would say the most important part is this QR code right here, which we'll get to a certain point. I'll show where this QR goes to and what's in there, but basically it's a support page that we have online for the blue laser. So I'll put that to the side. Then we have this styrofoam component or cube. This has all the small parts that are in the laser the hand tools that you need, uh, calibration glass, things like that, the flash drive, which I'll cover all those items once we get to unboxing this part. Move that to the side. Make sure there's no comments. Nope, nothing yet. And thanks guys for those of you that are tuning in. And then to take the machine out of the box, so this plastic bag is actually pretty strong. This is the easiest way we found to take the laser out. You grab it and by the center here with all the plastic, lift it up move the crate over and put the machine back down. If you can't lift the machine up by yourself, what you can do is have two people, so one on each side, kind of grab the center still, lift up, and then do the same thing. What you want to try to avoid in this process is any like big drop of the machine or a bump. So we do pre-calibrate the machines just to make sure that out of the box from China, that one, they're working, and two, that they're close in value, but because this is calibrated with an X and Y axis, which I'll go deeper into once we get to that part, bumps can throw that off. So if you get the machine and you, again, we're saying we pre-calibrate them, that doesn't mean you don't check the calibration. You always have to check it when you receive it because you don't want to uh, have the issue where it was bumped around a lot in shipping 
and now it's not calibrated and it could potentially mark where it's not supposed to on a phone. So you always want to check it out of the box. So what I'm going to do is take this bag off. Again, I'm going to try to avoid bumping it heavily. So just kind of take it out from the bottom, the front, the back two legs in the front two. Take the bag, put that back in the box. Styrofoam cube, move that over. And that's pretty much everything unboxed about the laser itself. Before we finish the unboxing side of things, I'm going to open up the couple small things. So we do have the fume extractor box. So when you order the laser, you get two packages. One is the laser machine itself, which is just the crate. The second is a small, star, or a small cardboard box, which is the fume extractor. And this one's just tape, so just a knife or something that uses the open tape boxes is good. And here you have the power cord to the fume extractor. You have the screws that attach the fume extractor hose plate to the back of the machine, which is this right here. And then you have the fume extractor itself. Right there. Put that box to the side. And then as far as this cube right here, we typically recommend just cutting one side of it because what you'll end up with is kind of like a little lid, so everything's in there. Which, as far as the unboxing process, that's it for this first part. So again, we have our machine itself, which came with the small cube that has the small parts in it. We have the extractor hoses and our extractor. So that's unboxing. We're gonna move on to setup. Scott's gonna reposition the camera, but while he's doing that, we're gonna switch over to the laser support page and I'll speak through that. Cool. So what you can see on the screen right now, is our blue laser support page. This is what that QR code is linked to. And what this has in it is from setup. So what I just showed for unboxing, there is a video and a guide for that, um, how to do calibration. When new models come out, you can update the files to do like say the iPhone 14s, which should come out here pretty soon. Um, there's an FAQ section. So the frequently asked questions that we get for the blue laser that people have asked in just the industry altogether are in there. And we have not only what the question is, but how to resolve it or what the answer is. And we feel pretty confidently that anything you may run into, we've either had come up before and we've resolved, or we can resolve ourselves. Um, a point that typically comes up with the blue laser, which I'll talk to while we're still switching the cameras, is, is this laser good? Which, <laughs> it's a hard question to answer because good is a relative thing. I would say, yes, this machine is good. Is it the top of the line machine when you're comparing to fiber lasers? No, because it's a different type of laser. Now, if you're just trying to get into back glass now and you're conscious of expense, this is the way to go because we're selling this laser right now for $1,400. All the other fiber lasers are easily around the two grand mark, so they're a lot more expensive because of the capability it has. So if you're trying to barely get started with back glass, this is the way to go because it's your lower, lowest cost option. Also, what a lot of repair shops find great about this is once you calibrate it and set it up, you're good. You just have to select a template you have to use and that's it for you. So you don't have to mess with aligning the phone or using mold or anything like that. It's all basically done for you. It's just like, and this analogy is, might sound kind of funny, but it's like the easy bake oven of laser machines because it, it looks kind of like an oven but it's very easy to operate once you have it set up. You basically set the phone in there, go and do something else while it's running, and you come back to it. We've had many customers happy with this machine because like I said, it's lower cost and easy to set up and use, and everyone's been very happy with it. So now that we've got everything on this side, we switch the camera over. This is the setup process. So first off, I'll point out, it says right here, need to dismantle the fixed piece and then can use the machine details, please watch operation video. The, this sticker is from the factory, so we're gonna peel that off. You can throw this away, but because this is the machine that we sell, and I'm gonna be using this just for demo purposes, we'll put it back together. But once you open the machine, you basically have two areas you have to work with. The first one is we have the platform down here that has two brackets. So we have a bracket on the left over here and a bracket on the right. There's two Allen wrench screws, which I'll cover. That's the first item that we're gonna be taking out. So we take our Allen wrench set. I believe it is the second from the largest. So, or sorry, third from the largest. Make sure that is it. Yep, that's it. So 
you just get in there, loosen it. And again, these brackets and bolts, anything you're taking off, I would just put into the cube, this right here, to hold on to it. Even better if you have a little plastic Ziploc bag. Keep it all together because same thing goes, if you have to ship the machine out for some reason, and this platform is just loose inside the machine, you run the risk of the platform just swinging up to the door and cracking the glass or breaking switches, which are things we have seen before when the machines were not shipped back properly. So we got one bracket out, and again, it's just like a Z bracket that holds the platform still. So we've got one out so far. Let me get that other one. What you might have to do, so rotate this a little bit. I can barely get to this top screw that's on the platform because the laser head's in the way. What I'll do is actually take out the laser screw. So there's this screw right here. It says need to dismantle screw. It's very important you take this off. It's right next to the laser head. What this does is keep the laser head from moving. So if you don't take that screw out, your machine is gonna basically move the platform and the laser head will make like a click click sound because it can't actually move across the uh, laser arm up here. So we took this out and it's possible you may get a variation of this sometimes they are zip tied with just a bigger zip tie if that's the case just cut it um, you just want to make sure that whatever is holding this laser head in a fixed position is removed so it can now freely move so we have that and then what i'll do is i'll move the laser head over so i can get to that other screw All right, sorry, I was a little slow. I was checking to make sure we didn't have any comments. And again, if you have any questions about this process, anything of it, even if it's something we haven't addressed, feel free to ask, because I'm sure we might get to it. Um, but the goal, again, is to answer everything related to the blue laser during this stream. So that's the second bracket off. So as far as pieces to remove, we're pretty much good on the inside of the machine. What I do have to do next is install something. So the way the fumes are handled with this machine, it's not an air purifier, but it's a fume extractor. So I'm trying to rotate this machine without bumping it too much. So what you have to do is install this plate on the back of the machine. So it has three holes that line up with the machine itself right here. You get a total of four screws in this little baggie. So it comes with an extra one in case you lose one. This is where a Phillips screwdriver is needed. So something like this. Um, if we use these and you can put Allen wrench uh, or hex keys in here. So we use them when we're processing a bunch of laser machines, like setting them up and testing them. This speeds up the process slightly. So I'm going to take this, tighten that screw. Second one in. And for this, you don't have to have it super, super tight. You do want to make sure that it stops turning though. So you see when it gives me that torque right there, that's good. And what this does is it funnels all the fumes because it has a fan right here that pushes the fumes out of the back of the machine, but it funnels, this, it funnels it into this hose. So what I'll do now is connect the hoses, which we have a total of two. And what you'll notice is one is longer than the other. So this is my short hose, and then this is my long hose over here. So the short hose is actually going to be the one that goes between the laser machine and the fume extractor. So the way this works is it's not really clamped on or anything. It's just pressure fit. So you do is get the hose, kind of get at an angle, and start twisting around there. And you just kind of twist back and forth. And when it gets to the point where the gray hose is up against that plate, you are good. See that right there? Yep, there we go. So now I can turn the machine around. Now I can connect it to my fume extractor. Now it has a little bit of a tension, so I'm going to rotate it to where the hose is facing this way. Try to stay in focus here. So now we have two entry point or two points on the fume extractor. We have air outlet and air intake. We want the air intake opening to go to the hose that's coming off the machine. So the air is coming into this and then air outlet, the other one is where the air is going out. So I'm gonna 
screw that on there. So same thing, it's just pressure fit. All right, now my air outlet hose, I'm gonna take the bigger hose, do the same thing. There we go. So again, those hoses are pretty easy to install. Now this is a, a great question that we typically get asked. Where does this go? So the preferred option is that this goes outside. Um, so that's either out a window or a cracked door. Um, either of those work. I understand though there is a limitation. Um, if say you're in a kiosk in a mall or you don't have access to an opening window or a door, I definitely get that. So what the solution is for that is you basically create a bubbler with a bucket and some water. So let's see if we can get a good view of this here. So I have maybe about, I would say four to six inches of water in there. The tube is actually gonna go into this water and you don't want it like completely, not at the very bottom, but you do want it far down enough to where when the air gets pushed through there, it creates bubbles. So in essence, what this is doing, any of the particulates which come out of the laser, so the smoke, the fumes, all that, will get captured by the water and then the clean air is what results out of it. Um, it doesn't completely eliminate the fumes, um, but it does do a great job of helping reduce it. So once we run a phone through there, we'll have we'll show this setup again, but that this is just the rough setup. I'm gonna move that to the side just so you see how that is. And then at this point, we're almost ready to begin the calibration process. A couple final things we're gonna do. We have a power cord for our fume extractor. So I will hook that up to the fume extractor. And we have a power cord for the laser. And before I actually put power to the machine, what we wanna do is connect our flash drive. So right here we have our flash drive which contains all the files. Uh, a common question we've gotten here before too is, is this a special flash drive? Aside from it coming with the machine, I would say no. It's just a SanDisk basic flash drive. It's 16 gigs. It really doesn't even have to be that big of a flash drive. And the reason I mention that, say you lose this flash drive or uh, the one you have, I've never seen one just stop working. These are pretty reliable, but say it stops working. Instead of having to order one or wait on one or anything like that, you can just take another standard flash drive. The process to create the file drive for this machine is actually on that blue laser support page that we showed. You download the files, you extract them, and it's a couple quick steps, but the whole process takes about five minutes, I would say. Put them on the flash drive and it's ready to go. So this flash drive plugs into the USB port over here on the side. And that's it, that's, that's where the, the files are, live on this machine. So if you do get a machine and for some reason it has only up to the iPhone 12, which I believe all of the ones we have here right now have 13 series, so if that's the case, you have to update it. But if not, the, the laser should be on the machine, uh, sorry, the template should be on there. Now, for when the 14s come out, we'll put a, an update on that page that we showed, the blue laser support page, that the files are available. You would go through that process to update this flash drive and you would be ready to go. So I'm gonna connect the power cables real quick. Because now we're ready to run power to the machine. All right, so now we're basically on the calibration process. So I have two switches I'm gonna flip. Well, right now the fume extractor is not super important, but there's the switch right here and it does have a variable speed switch right here. I would run it at the max because it just makes sense to have the most come out of it. You hear that bubble sound? There's my bubbler. So again, I'll show a better view of that once we have the the machine going, but I'm gonna turn that off for now just because it's kind of loud. Um, then I'm gonna, so there's two switches for power over here, and that's another important thing to understand. This one right here is like a breaker switch. If this is set to the off position, this won't allow the machine to fully power on. So you see how it's on, but the screen's not on, the machine's not really powered on. So you have to have this in the on position, and then you can flip that. You should hear a beep. There you go. 
And the reason I bring that up is sometimes, I don't know how, but I guess in the unboxing process, you can accidentally flip that. If you do that and you don't realize it and are just moving the switch and then you say, oh, my machine's not turning on, it's something as simple as the switch being flipped. So very easy fix, not too big a deal if that happens. So I'm gonna pull the sticker off. All right, so now I can go through the rest of the things in our small cube because we're gonna need them. I guess I can open the door to the machine as well. So the first thing is we have this right here. This is what's referred to as calibration glass. This is what's going to show us what our calibration is set to. So basically we're gonna run a template onto this and it's a specific file which I'll show on the screen, but we're gonna use this to verify. The machine comes with about 10 pieces of glass. Typically for the cal calibration process, if you have to edit anything, it's usually maybe use three to four glasses. Um, if you get to the point where you're going through all 10, what I would recommend doing is if say the, for some reason the calibration was very off, you can reuse pieces of glass you just have to make sure that you can differentiate where the new burn was versus the old one. Sometimes that can be done with taking a Sharpie and marking like maybe an X or a line that says this is the old one. So that way you know when you pull it out the second time, this is the new burn. But typically you have enough glass to run through there. Um, the next thing is this calibration bracket. So what we actually do is use this with this glass. It's very important you do that. It sets the height to where the glass is actually gonna mark. If you just throw this piece of glass in there without this right here, you're not gonna get a, uh, an accurate burn because it's not leveled right. Um, the next thing we have is our blue light laser calibration rod, our focal point rod. What this does is set the height of the laser, which I'll show here in a second since we're gonna get to the calibration process. Um, and then we have some safety glasses, which are kind of twofold. One, it, you can use them to protect your eyes from glass when you are prying it off. It does have a green tint to it, but the main focus of this is to protect your eyes from the light. Now, when the door is closed, it's kind of like a microwave where looking at the light that's in there, anything that's in there isn't gonna hurt you, but it's not recommended. Same thing with the machine. You don't wanna stare at the light because it is a bright light, um, but if for some reason you have to look to see if everything's going well, it is recommended you use these. And I would absolutely not open this and look at that bare light without using these glass. If for some reason you have to stop the machine or something has to be grabbed, it's really recommended to not even open the machine while it's running. I would hit stop or flip the power switch and then look inside the machine for safety. So that's what these are. And that's everything for this cube. That's all our small parts. So moving on to the calibration process. Let me check to make sure we didn't miss any chats. Okay. Brett posted the guide in there. Thanks, Brett. I think there's, there's no other questions yet, so we'll keep going. So for calibration here, what we're gonna do is bring the platform all the way to the front. Now, not having it to the front isn't gonna cause an issue, but these are all recommended options, or recommended setup steps based on what we've done. And I would say we've processed well over like 500 of these lasers by now, so it's worked pretty well for us so far, so I would recommend going this way. We're gonna take the calibration bracket, we're gonna place it right there in the center of the vise. We're gonna take a piece of the calibration glass, take the protective plastic off. We're gonna put it inside of the vise, just like that. And now this is a super important step and that's setting the height of the laser. Now, the way we do this, I'll try to get the best angle possible. There's a thumb screw on the right side of the laser head over here. You just loosen it. I would recommend having like a finger or your other hand holding the laser head so it doesn't slam down. But when you release that screw, the laser head can now go up and down. You can let it go all the way to the bottom while we uh, adjust this. What we're gonna do is take the rod, insert it on the edge of the laser head. And now it's very important you do it this way because as you'll see, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but in the center of the laser head, the very, very center, so like not just the edge, but inwards, that's where the actual light comes out of, and that has a different height to it. If you calibrate to that, you're not calibrating correctly, or you're not setting the height correctly, so it's not going to mark, or it's not gonna mark how it's supposed to. So we're putting it on the very edge, and then we, oh, very edge, then we're gonna tighten our focal, or sorry, our uh, focal points, thumb screw, on there and then we're good to go. And you don't have to really over tighten it, just make sure that the laser head isn't gonna move on you. 
So we do that. Next thing we're gonna do, let's see if we can get the screen shown here. So this is just a basic little touch screen. Um, if you have an issue with just using your, your fingers, so you do have to use something with a point to it, not just your like finger part, so your nail works. You notice it doesn't do anything until I hit the unlock button. When I hit unlock, now I can edit things on the machine. If you use the end of the rod as a stylus, it actually makes the, the moving things around a lot easier. So I'm gonna hit the arrow keys. There we go. So here, I'll go back so we can show that again. So you have to hit unlock to start using the machine, the screen. We're gonna hit carving. And then we're gonna find the file that says forward.in. So it's this file on the end. And what that is is the calibration file. I'll go ahead and turn the extractor on now. You don't have to show that, Scott. Um, just so it's, it'll start pulling fumes, but I'm gonna hit figures. And what it has is a percentage bar on there, so it starts off right away at like 24%, and it'll progress up as uh, the machine goes through everything. So what it's doing here is it's going to burn the perimeter of the glass, and then it's going to burn the center of the glass, the little diamond there. What you're looking for is that the burn mark is even all the way around and then around the center of the diamond as well. Because what that means is when you run a template, it's going to mark exactly where it's supposed to. If you do not complete this process and it does not mark where it's supposed to um, on the calibration glass, then what's gonna happen is the machine's only marking where it's programmed to. So if it's not calibrated right, you're telling it to mark in an incorrect spot, which it's very rare for a laser to damage a phone because really the, it, if you don't have it lined up right, it could hit a cable or maybe the battery area. But, but the majority of our boards are covered by the frame itself. So typically if something happens, the light cannot penetrate through metal into the board itself. Um, at most, I would say maybe if it's not calibrated, it's a charging board, so you have to replace that. Or a power flex is a common one. That one's damaged more often though from the removal of the glass when you're prying it off. But uh, again, it can happen if you don't have your laser calibrated correctly. Again, a lot of these things are avoid avoidable. They are kind of things that you learn through the process. I will say now versus when all these machines first came out, there's a lot more content available that helps guide you to prevent those issues, but it's not the end of the world if, say, something does happen, because again, it's part of learning it. The biggest thing is you don't want to damage a phone beyond repair, and like I said, I've never seen a laser do that. It's typically during the prying process, which we'll run through part of a phone today, just because the overall process to run the machine on a phone, I would say, is about 15 to 20 minutes, so just to keep the stream um, not at an hour long, we'll, we'll cut it maybe like after five minutes and pry off that glass. So open the machine up, see that it says 100% on there. We'll pull the glass off, and this I would consider good calibration. So if you do, I mean, if you look at the bottom, you see it's the very edge up here. It's maybe a tenth of a millimeter off, if that. But this right here, the edges are aligned, the center's aligned. You'll notice sometimes it may mark thicker in some areas, but as long as the alignment is good, uh, you won't have an issue. So that right there is good calibration. Now, one thing that people don't really think about, what we recommended as people work the calibration process is what do I do with this glass? I would call this your golden setting piece of glass. So say I, this wasn't gonna have to edit it. I'll show you how to do that. So, we can take the metal piece out since we won't need it anymore. Just put that to the side. And I'm going to turn the extractor off just so you can hear me through the mic a little better. Scott, if you can go to the screen. We'll get this all lined up before we uh, start touching on there. Check the comments. Nope, still good on the comments. All right. So what we're going to do is go back to the main screen. So I'm going to hit the back option here. To find your calibration value, values, you hit settings, center, and the secret passcode is 101515, and you hit the check mark. I was worried for a second. I <laughs> had type that in a bit, um, but that code is mentioned on all of our support stuff, so it's not like it's something you have to write down. 
So here we have two values. We have the X and the Y value. And the best way to think about this is it's like when you go back to, to algebra and you're looking at a grid, right? Your X uh, axis goes horizontal and your Y axis goes vertical. So what I'm gonna do here is write down my X value is 107.4. And I would recommend maybe using a marker with a thinner tip so it's easier to read. And then my Y value is 50.6. So you can mark this as like good or like perfect values, however you want to mark it. And this is where you're at originally. So say I do have to adjust this. The way you do that is you tap on the, the little window of each one. So say my X is what I need to change. I'm going to tap on that. So my X value is at 107.4. Just for theoretical purposes, say that my, when I burn this, it didn't, the mark was too far this way to the right. So when dealing with an X axis, anything too far, anything on the right side is gonna be positive. So what that means is I need to deduct from my X value. So my 107.4, depending on how far it is, I would need to take away from that. So I would maybe make it 107 or 106.9 to shift it back in the negative direction. And that's one misconception is if we, when we say, oh, you need to take away from it or go negative, this value doesn't let you type in a negative. It's always gonna be a positive number. You're just deducting or adding from it. Same thing goes with Y. Say my Y value, when this burned, the, the black line was down here and it needed to go up. That means my Y value is too negative, so I need to go up. So I would maybe take my 50.6 and make it 51 or uh, 52, depending on how far I need to go. And just those minor adjustments are what you have to do to edit it. So for example, say I needed to change the value, I'm gonna type 107.5, just as an example. I'm gonna hit the check mark, and then you have to hit confirm. The weird thing about the software, and we've, we've put the comment in, but unfortunately all this is like custom made by the factory. So you just hit confirm, I would say a couple times to make sure it's safe. A good way to make sure that the value is actually safe, go back, hit center, type in your code again. And now it says 107.5, that's to verify. Now I'm gonna change it back to 107.4 since I know that was the value that was good. My check, get confirmed a couple times. And then I'll go back in there just to be safe. 107.4, so we're good to go there. No adjustments needed, but that's pretty much all you have to adjust on the center side when you're doing calibration. Now, a question we'll typically get asked is, do I need to calibrate the machine after a certain amount of time? No, time isn't the variable that affects calibration. Movement does. And when I mean movement, it's not the internal machine moving, it's me grabbing this, picking it up, and moving it somewhere else. As I mentioned at the very beginning during the unboxing, if you bump the machine, that's what causes calibration to change. So if you don't bump it and you have it in one stationary spot, you're good to go. There's no reason to have to do anything with calibration. Um, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to take an iPhone. Uh, this is a 10 that I have. Just a, I think this one is a dead phone, so it's just for demonstration purposes. And another question we'll get is, do I have to take off the screen? No. This is meant to save you time and not have to disassemble a phone where Heat is a viable option for removing back glass. The only danger is that the level of heat you use, it, there's a wide range there. As to where the machine, it's, it's not really using any heat, it's using light. So if you do use too much heat and the phone's fully assembled, you can cause damage to certain parts. Um, so for this case, we're not disassembling anything. If you did have a phone that you were doing like multiple repairs for, like say I'm doing the battery and the screen on this one, um, you can run it through like this. The difference is when you set the, uh, the focal point height on the machine, you're gonna have to set it between each phone because the height is different. Now that is one thing you do have to set between every single phone you run. The iPhone 10, the 10R, the 11, the 12, the 13, they're all slightly different in their thickness. So you have to make sure that you set the height of the laser to the correct spot. Because if you ever run into an issue with your late where your laser is not marking or you it feels like you're having to really pry off the glass, it's typically involving the height of the laser head. So I'm gonna take this phone and you notice 
Can you zoom in a little bit right here, Scott? There's a sticker that, and I would leave this sticker on here. Don't pull it off. It says, please put your mobile phone like this. And on the left-hand side, it says top, and on the right-hand side, it says bottom. That's important because the template is programmed to run a certain way. If you put the phone in reverse, it's going to burn and remark in reverse, which will cause damage. So, or not damage, but it'll mark where it's not supposed to. So, I have my phone in here. My rear camera is towards the left-hand side of the machine, and my charging port is towards the right-hand side. Again, just like the sticker says, top is on the left, bottom is on the right. An additional thing that I will mention that is kind of a, an additional safeguard if you want to do it. Forgot to mention this during the unboxing because it was a separate part. This is just black or tape. Uh, I think they varied it. Sometimes there's a new aluminum color, but what this is meant for is to protect certain areas of the phone. So the manufacturer recommends, say you have an area where it's missing a chunk of glass, you can actually cover that with some of this. Um, it, it typically won't damage anything because again, it's burning on metal, but say you have like your charging port area exposed. If you're calibrated, should be no issue. We never use tape when we're running through the machine like this, but if it's just peace of mind that you want, you can take this and use it. Another area that sometimes people will cover is the rear camera area. So you can just take a small piece and cover the rear camera. Now, an important thing with the tape though, is you wanna make sure that it's not overlapping too much. And what I mean by that is it's not covering the glass area that you're removing because if you're covering it, the laser's not marking it, and that means it's gonna be harder to remove. What you can do, and I'm not gonna show it today, but you take some of this tape, you lay it over that, and you use just an X-Acto knife to cut around it, and what that does is shave it down to where it's only the rear camera lens and ring that's being covered, and not anything else it's not supposed to. So that's the tape. I'm gonna take my blue rod, I'm gonna make sure that my calibration, or my, I keep saying calibration, sorry, my focal point is set correctly, so me. So I loosen the screw, put the, the rod there, I'm gonna tighten it, and then pull that out, close that. Here, what I'll do is I'm gonna basically find the file, start it, and then I'll turn my extractor on so you can hear me a little bit clearer because I just realized the mic is right next to the extractor, so not sure what the audio quality is when the extractor is on. But again, I'm gonna hit, uh, right now I shouldn't have to unlock because the machine's already been on. I'm gonna hit carving. I'm gonna to go to, oh, I think I went to iPhone. And then one thing that we get a question on too, it says back cover and LCD. The LCD function is meant to help with the refurbishment process. And what it does specifically, if you're in refurbishing, you know, you have to take off the bezel to be able to separate the glass. Now the bezel is held on by cold press glue, which can, is basically the same type of glue that holds down the back glass. Now, um, if, if you are refurbishing, what you can do is put a screen in there. It's gonna burn that glue on the edges, so it's easy to remove the bezel. Um, it's not meant for opening a phone. If you do that, you're basically killing the screen. Or if you can refurbish it, you're good, but if you're just trying to use it for opening purposes, that's not what it's for. Um, so it's not very common you, you tap LCD, more common you hit back cover. I'll wait for that focus. And then I'm gonna hit, can you see that on there? Can you get a little closer? Thanks cameraman. All right, so now we have black, multicolor, and white. Now, these options can be a little bit confusing too, but the easiest way to remember it, if the phone is black, use black. If the phone is white, use white. Multicolors for everything in between. Um, gold is the kind, it's technically color, but I've run it on white, I've run it on multicolor, and they both work. I would say the settings for white are a little bit stronger. Um, so if you have an issue with running it on multicolor, like a gold phone, run it on white. It's in essence the same template, it's just the settings that uh, differ slightly. So we're gonna do black since this is a black phone. Now, this is another very important part. Make sure you select the right template. And this can go back to the intake process, right? A customer says, I have an iPhone 10R. Say in this case, they said that. It is 100% not a 10R, this is an iPhone 10. If you run the template based off of what they tell you, it is going to mark it incorrectly because you're telling the machine to do a template that is not for that phone. Um, and speaking of intake, this is one thing we did our workshop at the Gadget Repair Expo in San Antonio. 
we really push on is testing and being thorough with it. So when the customer comes in with a broken back glass, you test everything because there's always that off chance that say they um, dropped it in a way that damaged face ID or that it's not charging. There's a number of things that can be wrong with it and if you miss that, now it's a liability for your shop. So that's the first testing point is before you even work on the phone. The second one is after you run it through the machine, test it again. Because one, like I mentioned, common misconception is that the laser is damaging a phone. If you test the phone right out of the laser, I would say 99% of the time, the phone's gonna work without issue. The third test point is after you pry off the back glass. This is where it varies because user to, or tech to tech, you're using different pressure and going at it different ways. If you use too much force or you, you hit something you're not supposed to, that can cause the phone no longer to function. And again, it's all avoidable, but at least in this process, you know, all right, my failure point was after the back glass removal, so prying off the glass, not the machine, so you know the correct area that needs uh, attention as far as resolution goes. Um, and then final testing point is after the back glass is glued on before you give it to the customer. Again, it's just checkpoints in the whole process to make sure you know exactly where a breakdown is happening so you can prevent it in the future. But with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and run the machine. Again, let me make sure no chats came through. Nope, we're still good. I'm gonna go ahead and hit figures, and that's basically our go, and I'm gonna turn on our extractor. Scott, while that's going, you can keep it on the machine just until it starts, and then we'll kind of show what's happening with the extractor. All right, come over here a little bit. So you see when the bubbles stop, you don't want that, you want about that right there. So just enough under to where it's going to make the bubbles, and what I'm doing is slightly holding it up, like that is a little too deep. What you can do is usually use like a zip tie or maybe tape or something to tape the hose to the bucket. Sometimes you can get it to sit in there just with friction, which, let's see if I can get that in a certain way. I was doing it earlier, but I think when I moved the bucket, it changed, but that's about what you want right there. Now we can go back to the machine and you kind of show what's going on in there. solution that I thought was a pretty creative one. I've seen a couple shops use um, those five gallon uh, jugs that go in like water dispensers. You can put water in that and the, because the opening is so small, it helps keep the tube uh, from moving around. Let's see inside the machine. So it's at 22% right now and it's done, I would say maybe way to the rear camera. And as far as the fumes go, I will say, once you get the bucket to the right spot, let me take that out of the way, um, the fumes really are handled a lot better. Right now when I was messing with the height, um, you could definitely smell it a little bit more than when it was set to the right one. So I'd recommend maybe if you've already get done your calibration process, run it again, and it doesn't hurt to run that glass again that's in there with the, that, black, that white piece of glass. Set your hose up in that time too because the, the smells are a little bit less harsh when you're running the calibration glass or through the phone since it's just a white piece of glass. Um, and that way you're good to go before you start running a phone through the machine. While that's going, let me see if there's any questions that have popped up. Nothing just yet. Now, while this is going, again, like I said, I'm going to let it run. It's, uh, 
three minutes in right now. Let's see where it's at at the five minute mark, and then we'll start just prying the glass off at that point. But while that's going, I'm going to mention something that we have going on right now. Now until end of day Monday, we have a special where, like I mentioned, this laser is $1,400. If you purchase the laser, you can actually get this bundle right here for free. And I'll kind of show what's in here. This is a SKU that's on our website. I believe it's like a $90 value, uh, and you're getting it for free. So this is an alcohol bottle dispenser. Alcohol is good for cleanup when you're dealing with the, the back glass and the, uh, the like powder that's left off. This right here is, I would say, one of the most important tools when removing the glass. It's a back glass breaking pen, and I'll demo that on this phone here shortly. But basically, those areas of really tough glass, specifically when you have like two or three cameras going on, like on the iPhone uh, 12 Pros, 13 Pros, this helps break the glass. So that's an important tool. We have a pair of safety glasses, which again, you're dealing with a lot of broken glass. Uh, most shops have these already, but I would have a pair near the machine or near your back glass removal area because this glass, uh, it's, it's pretty intense, kind of like an iPad, and you want to make sure your eyes are safe. Um, this is the recommended uh, tool for prying off the back glass. Basically an X-Acto blade holder, except we don't use the, the angle blade that comes with this. You want to use this flat blade right here. Um, this flat blade has a very fine point to where you can easily get under the glass, but it's strong enough to where it's not going to break on you while you are prying the glass off. So uh, that's the removal tool. We have a brush that's basically meant to clean off the back of the frame, so you can use this in conjunction with the alcohol bottle and a microfiber to clean off the, that area. We have another alcohol bottle, and these are pretty cool. Uh, can you hand me that one, Scott, please? So this is great for dispensing alcohol onto the phone, so I'll try to show that. See, I'll, I'll show this on the phone, but basically it has a little needle applicator. We use these a lot for removing batteries on devices because you can precision apply alcohol and uh, it helps kind of cancel out the adhesive. We mainly use it for cleanup on the uh, back glass process, but you get two of them so you can uh, fill them with different liquids. I mean, alcohol is the main one we use, but there's some others out there, but I would just use alcohol. Uh, then we have the E8000. Now, this is where there's kind of two ways it can't go. Some people will use cold press glue to put the back glass on. We've been using E8000 since day one, two and a half, almost three years ago with the lasers and have had, haven't had a single warranty return or an issue with the person after the repairs uh, happened. And every customer that's bought the laser from us, this is the glue we push and everyone's had a great uh, run with it. It's an elastic adhesive, so it doesn't dry like super glue, it dries more like a, a stretchy glue. Um, we actually use this for a couple other things too, like gluing down uh, the home buttons on iPads, because it's basically non-existent when it comes to thickness. And that's what you want when you're dealing with adhesive so it doesn't mess with the spacing. Um, this tube, I would say, is good for at least 30 phones, if not more, depending on how much you use. Uh, it's a 110 milliliter version. Like I said, the glue is great. Um, we recommend, before handing the phone back to a customer, at least letting it cure for 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the absolute minimum. Uh, it's preferred, though, if you just let it sit until the customer comes to pick it up. The full cure time is about eight hours, so you definitely don't want them to be prying at the glass while it's fully curing, but I would say it's good for normal, like they can use their phone perfectly fine after about uh, 15 to 30 minutes of it drying. And then the final tool here that we have is a back glass press. Um, this is great for, so after applying the adhesive and uh, putting the back glass on, you put the phone in here and you tighten this and it puts even pressure onto the back glass and makes sure it really bonds on the frame and you don't have an issue with it lifting or separation. So those are all the tools that come in the kit. Um, like I said, if you don't buy the machine between now and Monday, you it, it is still recommended you get these things uh, separately. Um, but right now is a really good deal to just purchase it and get them for free. So again, that's the back glass tool bundle. Put that to the side. Make sure there's no chats. Oh, Brett put it, the link in there too. Thanks, Brett. Um, so we're at about the seven minute mark and I'm gonna go ahead and stop it. So to do that, I'm gonna use my blue rod. I'm gonna hit um, adjust and I'm gonna hit stop. Now before I do that, I'm gonna talk to another potential thing you may run into. White phones or phones with a matte finish can sometimes 
marked differently. And it's not necessarily like the, there's an issue with the machinery like that. We've literally tested like 10 of the same phones. So for example, 10 iPhone 11s, all white. Some burned with no issues, some did not. And what that tells us is the difference between the phones is there's something in the glass makeup or the adhesive, some variable there. But if you run into one where you're having a hard time marking it, these are the things I recommend. First, go to your settings and you want to change the um, move rate, or actually, sorry, not move rate, carb rate. You want to change the speed down to, I would say about 50 to 80%. What this does is it slows the laser down to where it spends more time over each area, which increases its effectiveness. The next thing is power. You would hit the plus sign to go up to 125. So speed down to 50 to 80%, power up to about 125. Those two things maximize the mark. Um, and again, you don't have to mess with this at all unless you do have an issue. The next one is the focal point. So Scott, if you can point it at the laser uh, inside the window again. So as I mentioned before, setting the height of the laser head is one of the more important points because if the laser is not the right height, it's not going to mark. So if you're having an issue with that, try lowering the laser head slightly. Usually it ends up being too high, which is what causes the issue. And then the final thing here, say you've run at least 20 phones to the machine. What happens over time, the fumes that don't get extracted can sometimes build up on the laser head itself where the light comes out of. And th it basically creates a thin film over where the light comes out and can affect the laser light and the power. So what you can do is, I recommend doing this maybe bi-weekly or at least monthly. Lift the laser head all the way up, take a Q-tip with some alcohol or a microfiber and just brush off that area where the light comes out of. Obviously, make sure that the machine is powered off, and I would even upload the power to be safe. But if you do that, there should be no issues with the, um, the light after that point. Now, if you're still having problems, let us know, but I would say at least 95% of the time, one of those four things will uh, cause the laser to mark again, and you'll be good to go. So I'm actually going to stop the machine now, so I'm gonna hit stop. It's gonna ask, are you sure, and then confirm. And again, wait until the blue light stops. So it's still kind of going because it's registering that it hits stop. There we go. So now that the blue light is done, I know I can't open my machine. So I'm gonna open it up. It actually did the majority of the phone, except for the bottom area right here. So here's my phone marked. I would say it maybe has like a bit or a sixth of it less left. So it started up here and worked it its way down. You'll notice, aside from down here, it didn't mark in danger areas. And what I mean by that, so up here, you turn the beam extractor off. Um, this is a wireless charging pad, which is a flex cable. If it hits that, it can cause damage. So you don't want that to happen. Um, up here is an exposed portion of the uh, frame. So right here, there's no metal. So it's just, uh, I believe there's a flex cable up there, an antenna. And then up here is another exposed portion in the frame. So because it didn't mark there, it means that when you are prying the glass off, you have to use extra caution to avoid damaging those areas. But as far as the blue laser goes, that's it for the running process. Um, I guess before we move on to prying the back glass, let me talk about some of the anatomy that's going on in here. I, I guess you can call it that, or maybe the, the build of the machine. So you'll notice if I move the machine, the platform back, you hear it click back there. That's a little switch that basically tells the machine that when it's hit there, it's all the way to the maximum for the platform to go back and it cannot go back anymore. Same thing when you move the laser head all the way to the left, you hear that click, same switch there. If you don't hear those clicks, and what it'll cause is when you run the machine, it, it might go haywire where it doesn't know where to go. Typically that's something that, that happens in transit. If say your laser head came loose and swung over and hit that, it can break that switch or say the platform. That's why it's very important to put those brackets back when you do, uh, if you do have to ship the machine out for whatever reason. So those are the important parts of it. You have a fan in the back. The laser head is connected via a wire on top of it. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So right here, there's a little wire that's connected to it. We pre-install and check all the laser heads, so yours should be fine, but if you ever have an issue where, you see how there's not a light on on top of the that laser head, check that. Um, there are a few switches on top of the head 
avoid touching them. Um, they vary in what they do. One of them will actually make the laser come on without the machine saying it's on. The other one, I believe, cuts the power to it. I don't know the, the full purpose of them, but that's how they manufactured it. Um, I do know that when they're in the correct positions, the machine works as it should, and we leave it in the correct position when it's sent to you. But if for some reason, again, you accidentally touch something, um, that could change. So just make sure to avoid those buttons. And uh, as far as the rest of the machine, that's pretty much it on the inside. As I mentioned before, this option is great because it's simple. I mean, you put the phone in there, say I wanted to run this other phone next, it is the exact same phone. Um, I would put it in there, set my focal height, so let me try to line it. So I put my phone in there, set the height of my laser, because again, it is different now, find my template and hit go. So say you have 10 of these lined up, what you can do is put one phone, run it through there, Again, go do something else in between. Maybe you're doing the intake on the others. Don't know. Um, but run that phone. When that one's done, you can start the prime process on that phone. Put another one in and just keep the machine going constantly. This does have the capability to do, I would say, about maybe five to ten back glasses a day. Um, but after a while, you'll notice, you know what, I need a faster machine. And that's where you may want to upgrade to one of the fiber machines. But to start out, this is a great machine. Um, again, We've had the Blue Laser, I would say, for about two years now, and it's been great for us and the customers we've sold it to, so no complaints on our side. Um, again, great solid machine. I'm gonna have this in the background, just gonna shift it back a little bit while I start the prying process. Um, that's my mistake on my side. I should have gotten an anti-static back or something to help protect the, the table, but we're gonna go ahead and just do it on here. I'll use the back of this packet. Um, so prying off the back glass. I'm gonna put some safety glasses on just so I'm good. I'm going to take my back glass breaking pen. I'm going to open it. And then one end has what's listed as power. I'm going to loosen that almost as much as it can go. And you'll notice it's all the way done when the cap comes off like this. So that's too far. But basically, I'm setting the power to as weak as it can. Having the glass crack a little bit more does aid in the removal. So we go a little bit more. But like I said, you, you don't want to use this in areas where there's danger. If I use this right here in the center, it has the chance to puncture all the way through and hit my battery. So I don't want that. So I just broke it up a little bit. I'm going to take my prying tool, so get my blade right here. And you can start on the edges if you can get an entry point. It's like I was able to get in right there. And I will say, you'll notice that some phones are definitely easier than others. Um, the iPhone 10, the 8, the 10R even. Really, I would say the 10 series and older are typically on the easier end. Some of the 11s too. When you get to your 12 and 13s, the difficulty does increase slightly. Um, one, because of the glass used and the cameras, but two, there's also magnets all the way around the um, wireless charging layer. So like right here, I have my wireless charging layer. I don't have magnets here. I still have to be careful with it, but um, I don't have those little magnets. Um, a tip for those, and we mentioned this at the expo, we do recommend stocking uh, replacement magnets just in case you lose them or happen to break them. And when I get around this wireless charging pad, I do want to make sure that the pad itself stays, stays down. So I'm kind of using one finger to push down. This is where using a heat gun may assist a little bit. Since this is double-sided adhesive, you don't need to use really high heat, but it'll help release that adhesive. You may need to notice I'm using my hands a lot. I've always used my hands a lot for repair. A uh, question we'll get is, should, should I use gloves for this? I would say it's not required, but it can help just to protect your hands if you have had an issue. Um, oh, the phone is working. Now, this was a testing phone, so the screen was already cracked. I guess I just turned it on during it, but we know the phone is working. Oh, the voiceover's on. All right, we're just gonna leave the screen like that for now. Um, but again, that's where you would test and make sure. I thought this phone was not working, apparently it is. 
And you're gonna get to some spots where it's a little bit harder to get the glass off. That's okay. Again, that's where using a little bit of heat or even some alcohol will help with that. Let's see, I'm gonna take some alcohol. Brush. You can see how it gets a lot of that dust off. I'm actually going to use this as well so I can actually dip my blade into the alcohol. One thing I completely forgot to grab, and Brett, if you're listening to this, if you can bring me a microfiber, that would help. Because a microfiber is great for really getting the dust off. The brush is good, but it's mainly for all the uh, shards of glass. Now, another tip here, which I forgot to mention before I started getting into this. If you are prying the back glass off without something that holds the, uh, the phone still, you do want to protect the screen. So taping it, so using like scotch tape or packing tape is great because as I'm moving this phone around, it helps if you clean up as you go. So like I would take this glass and just throw it away. Um, but if you do move the phone on top of the glass, it does have the chance to scratch the screen, which you want to avoid. You can tell right here, glass is definitely harder on there. You notice when I'm prying, I'm keeping my blade as flat as possible um, for two reasons. That avoids the downward impact on the frame, and two, it, it prevents me like slipping and hitting something. So, thanks, Brett. Got my microfiber. I'm gonna take this. And you notice, like, as soon as you start using this, it cleans off a lot of that debris. And it's important to do this not just so it has a clean look. I mean, the customer won't see it since it's covered up, but you see all that dust on there. This is what causes the smell. So say you don't clean up properly and you give the phone back to the customer, they may get it and be like, why does my phone smell burnt? That's why it's that powder. So you clean it off, no issues at all. And like I said, the rear camera area, that's typically where you're gonna have an issue, or not an issue, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. The uh, iPhone uh, 12, it, or sorry, 10 isn't that bad because it's only the single camera area. Let's make a power volume turn this on. Alright, maybe it turned off. Okay, cool. So, you see I have a couple areas here. Like I said, we won't finish the whole back glass repair today just for time. If you're interested in the whole process, you can look at one of our other videos. We did it with the Z1 where we did the whole back glass on an iPhone. I think it was a 12 Pro. Um, that shows the install of the glass too. So I'll get to about the point where we're ready to put the glass on and then we'll kind of finish it up there. I think I might have just held the power button. That's another thing to keep an eye, on, an eye out on. If you do hold the power button, the phone can power back on you. But I got to about that point right there, so that's pretty much all of my glass off, except for where it didn't mark. So here's where you notice the difference. If I try to pry this glass off, like I can't, I can't really even get my blade underneath that. That's where the laser really makes a big difference, and that's what sometimes people don't understand is that I still have to pry off the glass if the laser just made it come off. It doesn't just make it come off, but it makes this possible without the laser marking it. As I mentioned, you can use heat, but you saw it was fairly minimal effort to get that glass off. And again, this is an iPhone 12, so a little bit on the easier side. Um, but even with the 12 and 13 series, you don't run it through a laser or don't use heat, it's almost impossible to get the glass off with the glue that was used. So you do have to pry it off. Um, I'm gonna do it one final clean. So that's how dirty it was on one side. Let me get just a final cleanup on this side. Move that out of the way. I have to clean our conference room table before our next meeting. I'm trying to clean the table a little bit. All right, but so that right there is almost all the glass removed. Now, another question that we sometimes get is, do I need to run it through the machine again or do I need to take all this stuff off? So 
we've actually tested out various options this over the past and we leave it to this point right here because even though this doesn't seem like a whole lot, it helps keep the original thickness when it comes to the back glass. So if you do remove everything, there's a chance that the glass could look sunken in and that's not great for the look of it. Um, so you can leave this here, that's good. Again, like I mentioned, just clean off any residue. As far as the adhesive goes, you basically just lay it over where that is and what it'll do is kind of seep. It'll lay over that, but it'll fill in all the gaps too and let the glass sit evenly. So I would say cold press glue or 8000 is good. One thing I would stay away from using is double-sided tape. Um, and the reason for that is if the tape doesn't lay completely flat, you'll have little weak pockets or air pockets in the glass and that makes it very easy for when a customer presses on the back if there is that air pocket, it'll cause it to crack. So you don't want to do that. So cold press or 8000 are definitely the way to go. Um, let me see, final closing things. I think that is about it. Let me check to make sure there weren't any questions that came up. Okay, so closing up on the specials couple things I forgot. One is it is free shipping because the laser is over our shipping threshold. It does ship ground. So basically you pay $1,400, you get free shipping, you get the free kit. And uh, Brett just reminded me on the chat and everyone that's on there can see it as well. We've just started with Olympus Lending. Uh, if you apply and get approved, you can get, uh, you can pay as little as 150 a month. So if the cost has been keeping you away from doing back glass because of the laser being expensive or a certain amount, you can sign up for the financing and break that up to where it's not as big of a hit um, as it is if you just buy it all up front. So uh, definitely try that option out if you're interested in that. So overall, again, solid machine. Um, this is the one, if I was starting out with back glass, I would get into because, I mean, not to, put the other lasers down, but I don't have $2,700 to drop on a machine. And you may not have any of that either, but I would say $1,400 is a lot easier for me to swallow as far as an investment goes into if I had my own repair shop and I was trying to get started with the service. Because going back to the financial side of it, we've only talked about cost so far. What you can make with this is a whole other side. And on average, I would say you can retail the repair for 100 to 150 bucks, depending on the model. And the cost of each repair is at most, I would say, 25 bucks. That's with your labor and your part combined. I, obviously, after the cost of the machine. So you're making like 70 to $130 or $120 per repair. I don't know what other repair you do right now in this industry that has that high of a margin besides maybe micro soldering or refurbishment. So this is definitely a way to go. And I would say as far as difficulty goes, this is on the easier end versus refurbishment or micro soldering. So if you're trying to get into other areas of repair business, this is the one I would really start with before you jump into the others. Um, and the others are great too, but like I said, we've always had a thing for the laser side and back glass. And, who doesn't want to make uh, good money on repairs, right? Um, but if there are no other comments, which doesn't look like there are, we're gonna end it at that today. Thanks guys for staying tuned for the stream. We don't have the topic for next week up just yet, but if you do have any recommendations, or have anything we wanna cover, or you want us to cover, let us know. As I mentioned in the past, and I think we had a Facebook post or Instagram post, if you recommend a topic that we have not done before and it's chosen, you'll get a giveaway sent with your next order. Um, we really don't have any detail on what that giveaway is. We try to make it tied to whatever the topic is. So it might be a tool, might be a part, might even be discount on a repair service, who knows. Um, but definitely get those our way because our goal with this series is to cover things that you want to see. And without hearing from you, it's kind of hard to do that. So definitely let us know. But I hope everyone enjoyed it. Has a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend. We'll see everyone next week. Tech Bob out.